I'm so excited to be in Brisbane for the first time, and at Big Sound, I've seen speeches from Jessica Hopper and Kim Gordon at this conference before, and it feels kind of surreal to be asked to do the same. So thank you for being here, and thank you for asking me to speak. Um, I want to talk today to you about some of the efforts that Jillian's mentioned, basically the ways in which being a musician and an activist can intersect. Um, I spend a lot of time worrying about the economics of the music industry, as an independent, full-time musician, basically every day I spend hours typing furiously on my laptop, scheduling never-ending tours and plotting releases that earn significantly less than similar records might have pulled in 10 years ago, uh, basically acting as my own unpaid intern. But I also spend a lot of time thinking about the economics of care. Uh, with the career that pays out in ever-fluctuating mystery income, I wonder how I can carve out the resources, both time and money, uh, to support the causes that matter to me. So I read this essay recently that kind of summed up for me why so many musicians that I care about are able to spend their time working towards social justice in spite of limited energy and resources. Um, it's a chapter in this book, The Chairs Are Where the People Go, which is transcriptions of some self-helpy discursions by Sheila Hetty and the lecturer Misha Glauberman. Some of it is about literally strategies for how to play charades, um, and a lot of it is about how not to be boring when you're speaking at a conference, which I hope has helped me today, and if not, don't tell me later. Um, and a lot of it's about community organizing, and I want to read to you something from the chapter, Don't Pretend There Is No Leader. In certain kinds of creative groups and certain kinds of activist groups, there is a pretense that everything is collaborative and non-hierarchical, when in truth someone is the leader. In some cases, people who feel nervous about leading might be taking their leadership too seriously, thinking it's so powerful that they have to temper it. Also, they may not realize that people who aren't leaders typically don't want to make all the decisions. What they specifically appreciate about the leader is that the leader can provide a vision and make decisions. I think this happens with bands all the time, and in social justice activism. In these realms, it can be hard, because there's often an ideological opposition to the idea of leadership. And that's no good. It doesn't work. And it is all born out of a bad politeness. So I don't universally uh, agree that a band needs one leader, and I think that if you are a mega fan of Slater Kinney, you probably can't hold that viewpoint either. Um, and some of the most significant resistance groups today, like Black Lives Matter, work collaboratively. But I think that Glauberman's onto something about the parallels between band leaders and activists, because at the heart of both of these efforts are empathy and creativity. And so many artists are motivated by the hurts in our lives, and while it's important to advocate for ourselves, it's equally crucial to use our platforms to combat the systemic problems that impact our peers, especially the ones that our privileges have shielded us from. Um, so my careers as a musician and activist first coincided when I was a teenage fangirl, uh, which teen girl fandoms quite literally run the music industry, as Harry Styles knows. Um, so when I was morphing into a teen, I was obsessed with Mouseketeer Pop, which means I'm very happy about this headset mic I get to wear today. <laughs> I asked for a Fender Strat for my 13th birthday because I'd seen the Josie and the Pussycats movie. Has anyone seen that? Um, so whenever I'm asked about poignant representations of women in rock music, I cite this, partially because I think it's really cute that I learned an instrument that is the basis of my entire career because I saw Rachel Lee Cook pantomiming power chords in uh, a box office failure. Um, but also it saddens me that I spent hours daily listening to the radio, obsessing over pop, but it took a fictional band to inspire me to write my own songs and try for myself. And statistically, that's unsurprising. Um, men are about twice as likely as women to play guitar, and in elementary through high school programs, boys make up about 80% of electric guitar players, um, until St. Vincent's model for Music Maker, which came out uh, this year, it's really cool looking, um, most guitars marketed towards female players distinguish themselves through cuteness, like which unfairly contributes to this mistaken belief that uh, femininity is incompatible with technical chops or that cuteness is um, accessible to men. So before magazines like She Shreds and Tom Tom, media representations of female rock players were usually just like sales models in bikinis, which St. Vincent actually parodied on the cover of a magazine wearing like one of those huge t-shirts of a bikini body. You see that? Um, so during my first few years of playing, I always felt devalued or presumed to have a playing ability that was less than. 
And I think teen girls have enough self-esteem hurdles to navigate without being told they're genetically predisposed to suck at their instruments. Um, and I really kind of bought into those false narratives about women and the guitar. I felt I was doomed to forever be a rhythm guitarist while the boys got to take the solos. And I remember auditioning to play in the high school jazz combo and doing a good job, but failing at the last minute because I feared I wouldn't be able to keep up, um, which is depressing to me now. Uh, and I was very lucky that my ex-punk mom signed me up for like a hippy-dippy arts camp right as I was entering eighth grade. And my gender esteem got some CPR thanks to the other girls I met there. They were punks and they played drums in power violence bands and had mohawks and knew how to solder guitar pedals, um, which was kind of revelatory to me. I learned how to write songs and record music and screen print t-shirts and book shows, basically everything I now do for a living. Uh, while I was at this camp, and I stopped feeling like my gender had anything to do with my interests. I went back to school with this utterly reformed confidence that still dictates my desire to be the best player I can, and to refuse to let other people's misconceptions about femme identities impact what I can do as a guitarist or as a person. kind of want to walk around, is that... You guys like that? Okay. Um, so these teenage guitar years took place while W. Bush was in office, and that's sort of where the activist element comes in. Um, a lot of the bands I idolized at that time and was learning in guitar lessons were releasing political music. They were speaking out against the ongoing war in Iraq, um, the anti-LGBT administration's policy on marriage equality, a fight which many of you here today can probably relate to this year. Um, and I obsessed over benefit compilations. Barstick Records had one, Discord Records had one. There was Rock Against Bush, which inspired Rock Against Howard. Um, and I'd grown up listening to ska and anarchist punk and countercultural music that my parents had enjoyed. Uh, so I knew that rock could be political, but this was the first time in my life that I felt like the bands that were my bands were kind of taking a stand and using their music as a platform for political engagement. And that made me want to participate too, but the musicians I saw as models for this were like hugely successful artists and I didn't have a sense of what I could accomplish as a young DIY songwriter with basically no resources other than like babysitting money and I worked on a farm. <laughs> so I volunteered, I was envelope stuffing on weekends and helped behind the scenes at benefit concerts and day to day I felt filled with a level of anger and indignation that was probably exactly appropriate for a young feminist in 2005. Um, but when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans that year, I gained kind of a different understanding about the imbalances in my country beyond just my gender. And watching footage of evacuees waiting on the roofs um, of totally flooded homes, my dad, who had lived in New Orleans, worrying about his friends' lives who were missing, we were all grieving, but it was um, Kanye West's blunt and rightful declaration that George Bush doesn't care about black people that illuminated in no uncertain terms that racism was so inherent in our federal government. And it was a bias that made Katrina so much worse for residents of New Orleans than if it had hit in a city with more money and a wider population, like the one I lived in in America's Northeast. So I started to wake up to my white and class privileges that not only did I have a safe home, dry home, that I came from a family with money to pay for musical instruments and lessons and recording and summer camps, and I kind of felt my privilege and felt that I had to reallocate it in some way. Um, so I was working on my very first album at the time in my friend's attic on weekends, and it was like, okay. Uh, not as good as some other teen debuts I can think of, like Lord. But um, I decided to donate the proceeds of the album to Hurricane Relief and planned a big benefit show too, um, following like a DIY press campaign that was mostly me harassing by email the local newspaper and begging my friends' bands to play. Uh, we put on this really fun event that raised around $5,000 to help New Orleans families rebuild their homes. And as a 17-year-old, it's like not a number I could ever have donated independently out of my literal piggy bank savings. Um, and it was a good lesson that while DIY is powerful, doing it together can have a much more profound impact. Um, and so community organizing is sort of a model I've continued to use throughout my career as a musician, basically from my very first album. And then, so the past six years I've spent kind of growing up alongside this band Speedy Ortiz, and we've been able to undertake a number of charitable projects, some of which Jillian mentioned earlier. We've given away album and track proceeds to benefit large national organizations like Planned Parenthood, the Southern Poverty Law Center, 
as well as localized crisis relief efforts like the Ferguson Library and Baltimore Food Bank. We've organized benefit shows and charity tours, giving away 100% of profit to groups we believe in, like the Girls Rock Camp Foundation. Is anyone here involved with Girls Rock Australia? Oh, we're going to change that today, hopefully. Um, and in 2015, we instituted the Safer Spaces Initiative as part of our tour rider, including a fan help hotline that was the first of its kind. Um, we started distributing bystander intervention instructional worksheets at the merch table. We've been intentional about the artists we bring on tour and the crew we employ, making sure that furthering inclusivity and representation in the music industry is very central to our hiring and decision-making practices. Because I think for any real change to occur in the music industry, we need to see a diversity of opinions and backgrounds represented on stage and behind the scenes. Um, for many of us who grew up in DIY, playing like, benefit shows in anti-capitalist spaces like church basements and veterans halls and somebody's mom's garage, uh, punk politics are second nature. And after Trump's election, there were so many American bands at the arena level and at the house show level who declared their shows to be safe spaces but without explicitly defining what a safe space meant, how they intended to deliver that safety, or an even tacit acknowledgement that safety looks very different for folks depending on the color of their skin, their gender identity, or their sexual orientation. Yes, we need more outspoken feminists of all genders in music. We need more bands and festivals that care about preventing assault and embracing safer space policies. But my hope is that when well-intentioned bands speak out against bigotry, allying themselves with feminism and anti-racism and anti-homophobia, that these aren't just vacant gestures, that they work in an organized way to affect a radical change in the lives of their fans and peers. I think that taking a stand for show without taking any action is akin to the kind of bad politeness I mentioned earlier. When everyone wants to be helpful, but no one really leads, how can real change come about? My hope is that artists, promoters, bookers, stage crew, sound engineers, tour managers, basically all of you here today, recognize that there are small concrete steps that you can take to improve your communities, both inside and outside of the music industry, and that you can move past verbal allyship into radically caring proactivity. Femme musicians are better represented now than when I was a teen, Though there's still a lot we're shut out of, evidenced by the woefully slim percentage of us who appear on festival stages. But it's even more important to recognize the advantages that come with being white, cisgender, able-bodied, and to advocate for the inclusion of musicians of color, trans and non-binary musicians, and disabled musicians, even if it means giving up your own spot. To remain silent about the music industry's many exclusionary biases isn't intersectional feminism, which means it's just not feminist. There are so many ways to use the music industry for good, many of which don't require financial sacrifices from artists who are underpaid already. Uh, I'm going to discuss some of these strategies in detail with Jillian and name some of the ones that I find most significant. And I also want to speak with her about some of the initiatives Pitchfork's taken to work towards these goals. I think by granting greater editorial space to artists from diverse backgrounds, and prioritizing focus on these artists' processes and their work, rather than tokenizing their identities, we can ensure that more kids feel represented and are inspired to pursue the things they're good at, not just the things they think they're supposed to like. It's also 100% crucial to listen to and believe the accounts of artists and fans who come forward when they experience belittlement, harassment, or violence in this industry. Accountability begins when we stand with and support survivors. To ignore the problems that don't impact us directly is one of the ugliest things we do with privilege and is in itself a form of replicating and maintaining oppression. That's the baseline way in which we all have to participate, evaluating our identities, using what we do have to create space for those who've been categorically denied. It's vital to listen, but it's also vital to put in the work and not let the burden of improving our unfair world fall squarely on those who've, against all odds, thrived in it. Let survivors make art and support them for it. Let's build a better music scene, one based in empathy as well as creativity, like all art should be. Thanks. <laughs>